appear today has made several seminal contributions to research in biomechanics related to fundamental structure function relationships in musculoskeletal soft tissues, subject specific modeling of joint mechanics, image based biomechanics, and the development and distribution of FE Bio Software Suite. He leads an active research program and is currently funded by four different NIH R01 grants and also several NIH subcontracts. He has been a dedicated and highly recognized teacher for the last 15 years, developing an entirely new curriculum of four biomechanics courses for the Department of Bioengineering at the, here at the University of Utah. His dedication to teaching has been recognized by the College of Engineering several times for achieving course evaluations in the top 10% of the entire college. Within his lab, he has mentored 30 undergraduate research assistants, 10 master's students, 15 PhDs, and five postdoctoral fellows. Please join me in welcoming one of our own, a researcher, educator, and alumnus, Dr. Jeff Weiss. Thanks, thanks very much for the, for the wonderful introduction. Is the volume okay? Does that sound good? Great. It's nice to be here. I wanna, wanna thank Dr. Tresco for inviting me and to, not the least of which it's another opportunity for me to wear this long sleeve button down shirt here, which I don't think I've had one on for four or five months yet. So, so uh, turn that down just a little bit. So I just thought I'd give an overview of the different projects, the different research projects that are going on in my laboratory today. And given that I'm the only thing standing between you and lunch, I'll try to keep it uh, relatively brief. Uh, my lab's located in Merrill Engineering Building, and my laboratory personnel consists of several faculty that I collaborate with, um, actually three of which are my former students, uh, four full-time staff members, graduate students, and undergraduate students. And, and as Smitty mentioned, we have a number of different projects going on. I thought I'd talk about four of those today, just give a kind of a high-level overview of those, those projects. So the, these are the projects I'd like to talk about. The first one is an area I've been working in for a long time related to the structure and function of connective tissues. The second project is, uh, you, you heard Lowell speak about earlier. It's related to the mechanics of angiogenesis. The third research project is related to modeling hip biomechanics on, in a patient-specific basis, based on patient-specific image data and functional data. And finally, I'd like to talk about our, our, the software that we distribute in our lab that we've developed over the last 10 years. It's called FEBio. So in terms of the structure and function of ligaments, this is an area I've been active in for about 20 years, and we've actually been fortunate enough to have funding from NIH continuously on the same grant for the last 13 years. And we've done research in a number of different sub-areas. One is the role of non-collagenous components of the extracellular matrix. Another is looking at the multi-scale mechanics of ligaments and tendons, and also looking at subject-specific modeling of ligaments, and I'd like to talk a little bit about each of those. Um, if we look at ligaments, they consist primarily of type 1 collagen. So about 60, 70 percent of the tissue is type 1 collagen. And the remainder of the tissue is water, but there are these other solid components in the tissue. And, and one of the things we've been focusing on in the laboratory over the last few years is trying to understand whether or not these different components also have a mechanical contribution to the structure. So because ligament has this kind of hierarchical structure going from the macro scale down to the nano scale, uh, the collagen is organized into different sort of functional motifs at each level. And in between, though, the collagen um, are these other materials that make up these, this non-collagenous extracellular matrix. And so one of the things that we've been looking at are decorin proteoglycans. This is the most prevalent proteoglycan in ligaments and tendons. And um, it's known to regulate the formation and growth of collagen fibrils during fibrillogenesis. And for a long time, people thought that it also had a mechanical contribution at the continuum level. In other words, um, the, the actual molecule itself contributed mechanically. And so we were interested in looking at whether or not this was the case. And the difficulty in trying to sort this out is, is finding a way to uh, remove the, the, uh, the gag itself, um, the, the dermatans sulfate um, side chain that's on, on, on decorin from the tissue without damaging the tissue. And so we found that we could use um, chondroitinase B to accomplish that. So by developing a protocol that allowed us to repeatedly test the same piece of tissue mechanically, we were able to isolate the effects 
of chondroitin ACE B and look at how it affects the material properties of the tissue. So this just shows TEM images of the gag side chains of decorin, these little black dots here, within, within ligament tissue before and after it's been tr treated with chondroitin ASB. And we found that we were able to demonstrate biochemically that we could remove the, the, the glycosaminoglycans from the tissue that are associated with, with thermotensil, with, um, with decorin. And then we looked mechanically at the effects of treating the tissue with chondroitin ASB by being able to repeatedly treat the same piece of tissue. And so this protocol has actually been, become very useful for us because now we can look at treatments with other types of enzyma enzymatic activity to isolate the effects of different parts of the non-collagenous matrix. And so here we see the stress-strain behavior before and after treatment um, in tension, and then the same thing in shear. And then finally, we see the effects of treatment on on the um, permeability of the tissue. And the summary, the summary of this, the take-home message here is that we were in fact able to show that no, this doesn't have a cross-linking type of function between the collagen fibrils. Rather, the proteoglycans themselves inhibit water movement through the tissue and thus they affect the intrinsic permeability of the tissue. And so these molecules primarily influence the time-dependent behavior rather than, rather than the um, quasi-static behavior of the tissue. And we were able to take that same type of treatment protocol and testing procedure and adapt it to look at elastin. So a ligament doesn't have as much elastin as something like uh, an artery or, or certain other structures in the body, but it has a pretty significant amount in it and it wasn't really clear to people what it did. Elastin's kind of a coiled up molecule and when you stretch it out, it can store a lot of energy. But in terms of its mechanical properties, it's a lot softer than the collagen that makes up the tissue. So it wasn't clear whether or not elastin contributed to the tissue's material properties. So we took a similar type of testing protocol where we treat the tissue with elastase and we were able to demonstrate actually that, that elastin actually does have quite a significant contribution in the toe region of the stress strain curve. So if you look here, you'll see the stress in the tissue on, on the y-axis and the, and the clamp to clamp strain on the, on, on the x-axis. And although this is about 10% clamp to clamp strain, this only corresponds to about 5% tissue strain. And so that's pretty much what we call the toe region or where the collagen is, is still uncrimping in the tissue. And in this region, actually, elastin has a pretty significant contribution to the material properties. The other thing we were able to show is by looking at the change in stress, you can see that at these higher strain levels, there's a pretty significant contribution to elastin in the tissue. And we were actually the first people to actually show what the role of this molecule is in terms of its material response in the tissue. One of the other areas of ligament mechanics that we've been focusing on is understanding the relationship between the global or continuum level material properties and the microscale material properties. And one of my former students, Sean Reese, was the primary person re responsible for this research. The idea being that if you look at tissue at the macro level like a ligament, it, you know, it looks like a, a uniform piece of shiny white tissue with fibers running through it. But then if you begin to look at different smaller scales in the tissue, and micron and the nanometer level, you'll find that the tissue has a very intricate structure. And this structure is very important for how forces are transmitted to the cells, for instance, and for the damage mechanisms that control whether or not these tissues fail. And so we were interested in trying to study this, but this is a very difficult problem to um, assess in live tissue because it's impossible to tease out the individual structural levels and and look at them mechanically at different, at, at different times. So the approach that we took was actually to develop a physical surrogate. And Sean spent some time working in the laboratory with collagen, extruded collagen fibers and collagen gels. And, and what he was able to do was put together a composite material that consisted of extruded collagen fibers embedded within a collagen gel matrix. And so by labeling each component of the fibers and the gels with different um, fluorescent microbeads, it allowed us to isolate and track the strain in the different parts of the tissue at the same time. So under a confocal microscope, we put, excuse me, put the tissue into a test chamber, and then while we stretch it, we can measure the strain in the different pieces of the tissue and look at, for instance, how the fibers are deforming relative to the matrix part of the tissue. And so by building a micromechanical model of this tissue surrogate that we constructed, we're able to understand the stress and strain in the different pieces of the tissue and be able to study the mechanics of this composite. So first we characterize the material properties of the gel, that's the red part of the matrix here, 
and then the material properties of the fiber experimentally, and then developed a constituent model that we could use to describe each of these components individually, and then use the, then use the, um, the 3D finite element model to describe the composite structure, and then we could compare the predictions from the finite element model with those of the experiment. So what we were able to show is not only can we accurately predict the stresses and strains at the ma macroscopic level, the continuum level, but at the same time we can predict the stresses and strains at the microscopic level. And so now this gives us an opportunity to study the structure of these composite tissues using a physical surrogate. And in the surrogate we can vary, for instance, the fiber spacing, the fiber diameter, the waviness or crimp pattern and the helical structure, and it actually becomes a reasonable approach for studying a lot of different types of um, hierarchical soft tissues. And finally, I just wanted to go over an approach that we've been using to, to study ligament mechanics based on subject-specific modeling. So the idea was really that there's enough variation in the mechanics between joints of individuals that if we want to understand how the mechanics of a specific ligament is functioning in a specific joint, we really need to be able to look at that individual joint and understand the material properties and the mechanics of that individual joint. So we developed a procedure that allowed us to um, construct and validate patient-specific or subject-specific models of ligaments. And the approach is based on using volumetric image data to get the structure of the ligaments and the bones and simultaneously using experimental measurements of strain for model validation. And so this allows us to perform computer predictions of the, of the strain and stress in the tissue. At the same time, we're doing experiments that allow us to validate that data. And so, for instance, if we look at our experimental measurements of strain versus our finite element predictions of strain, we first were able to show that we get very good agreement between these two sets of data. And then we're able to subsequently use these models to look at different types of um, interesting clinical cases. In this case, we're looking at anterior-posterior anterior loading of the knee with the ACL intact and the ACL cut. On the, on the x-axis, you see displacement, and on the y-axis, you see the anterior-posterior reaction force. And you can see clearly that after the ACL is cut, as you would expect, you see a large increase in anterior displacement in reaction to this force. And as, as people have often thought, you don't see this effect on the varus valgus loading. And one of the things that we were able to do is show using these subject-specific models that this also corresponds to changes in the insertion site forces of, of individual knees. And you can actually show that the ACL deficiency increases the forces on the MCL, and so it actually compensates during, um, during anterior-posterior loading for the absence of the ACL if you, if you get an ACL rupture. So the second area I'd like to talk about, it, and I'll talk about this a little bit briefly since Lowell covered already, is our project looking at the mechanics of angiogenesis. And this, this, this grant has a few different components. Um, the first two are, are with my collaborators, Rivers Utzinger at the University of Arizona and Jay Hoying at the University of Louisville. And Jay is a vascular biologist and Ur's specialty is, is in multi-photon imaging. And my contribution to this project is primarily in the in vitro mechanics. And this, this project's been funded continuously since 2003. And our focus in this project has actually been an in vitro model of angiogenesis, where we, we isolate microvessel fragments from fat pads, and then we do a partial collagenase digestion of the fat pads, and filter them out, and resuspend them in a collagen gel. And if we take these fragments and polymerize the gel and, and leave it in an incubator, over time, these microvascular fragments sprout, elongate, and grow very detailed um, microvascular networks. And you can take these microvascular networks and implant them into, for instance, a skid mice, and they will inosculate with the host circulation and begin to carry blood. So this model is a really nice way for, it's kind of an organ culture model of angiogenesis that we've been using in the laboratory to study how mechanical factors influence the growth of microvessels. And so in the laboratory, one of the first studies we did back in 2008 was to look at how static and dynamic stretching and just the, the boundary condition of no stretch would affect the structure of the microvessels. And we, were, we expected to see some sort of augmentation by cyclically stretching or, or holding some stretch on the tissue. But in fact, what we found was all we had to do was just fix the ends of our culture, and we got dramatic alignment of the microvessels. These are confocal images of the microvessels growing in, in 3D, 
just kind of a um, Z projection of the stack. And so based on this, we thought, well, if this is the case, then maybe we can control the way the microvessels grow by varying the boundary conditions in the culture. And so the next study we did was one that Lowell uh, referenced, where we looked at different boundary conditions. So in this case, we have an unconstrained gel. Um, so all the edges are free. In this case, we constrained the long axis. And in this case, we constrained all axes. And this case was the short and the long axis constraint. And this was work done by my former postdoc, Clay Underwood. And the interesting thing here is that when the long axis is constrained, these gels are free to retract laterally. Excuse me. Technology. And so since they're free to retract laterally, they, they can neck down. And so that necking down allows them to, the, the microvessels to pull on the collagen and thus neck it down and align themselves along the long axis. And we know that's what's going on by looking at the short axis constraint case. So this is kind of like a strip biaxial um, type of mechanical test where the gel can't really retract laterally due to the geometry. And so in this case, we see again, we see the random orientation that we get in the unconstrained and when they're fully constrained. The other thing that you'll notice is this difference in density between when it's fully constrained and unconstrained. And, and a lot of this just has to do with the fact that these microvessels pull on the extracellular matrix and contract the gel down so that actually there's, a, there's more vessels in a smaller volume at that point. The other thing that we've studied is the effects of matrix density. And all of these factors, such as the boundary conditions and the matrix density, have at least as much effect on the growth and the orientation of these microvessels as, say, adding something like VEGF to the culture. So these vessels are very, very sensitive to mechanical factors. And so one of the things that we've kind of done to summarize that is, is look at this as kind of a feedback between how these microvessels affect the extracellular matrix and how the changes in the extracellular matrix cause these microvessels to respond. So in other words, as these vessels grow, they produce proteases that break down the extracellular matrix so that it, they can actually extend into it. And then as that affects the extracellular matrix properties, that controls the way that the microvessels can attach and then pull on the extracellular matrix and change its geometry. And so we've taken all of that and put that into uh, a model, a discrete element model of the way microvessels grow in these cultures. And, and this is the work that Lowell presented earlier. There are two components to the model. One part is the growth of the vessels. And the other part is how that growth interacts with the deformation of, of the matrix itself. And so to model, so this is show, just shows the discrete element growth model, which has a number of different components in it, including branching, anastomosis, and changes in the orientation of the vessels based on the extracellular matrix. And as Lowell showed, we're able to take that discrete element growth model and couple it with a continuum model of matrix deformation to predict the type of experimental alignment of microvessels that we see in our experimental cultures. And so by coupling the discrete element growth model with the software FEBio, we can, we can look at both growth and deformation together. And this actually has a lot of potential applications outside of the mechanics of angiogenesis. So um, including cellular motility and looking at growth of other tissues and tissue morphogenesis. And all of these capabilities can now be looked at using the methods that we've developed for looking at angiogenesis. So the third topic I wanted to give an overview of is the, is the subject that Corinne presented. And, and for the last eight years, we've been looking at methods to allow us to build patient-specific models of hip biomechanics. And the reason is primarily because of osteoarthritis and studying how osteoarthritis initiates and progresses. So in osteoarthritis, mechanical factors in the joint cause some initial damage to the cartilage that leads to kind of a systematic loss of cartilage due to a chronic inflammatory response. So you usually have some mechanical trigger that's either related to a traumatic event or an alteration in the joint geometry that over time leads to joint destruction. And you know, about 9% of the US population suffers from osteoarthritis. And hip OA in particular has a couple of different patient subgroups that are known to be highly correlated with, with, um, with particular types of morphologic abnormalities, in particular dysplasia and retroversion. And so we've been working with Chris Peters um, in the Department of Orthopedics and his patient populations to be able to develop an approach for patient-specific modeling of, of hip biomechanics. And so this is, a, this is a, another NIH-funded project that's been going on for the last five years or so. 
And what we've done during this project is develop ways that we can build up patient-specific models of articular cartilage geometry and, and the bones in the pelvis and the femur so that we can analyze on the computer the stresses, the contact stresses in the joint. And we've validated these models using experimental measurements on cadaveric tissue to demonstrate that we can actually predict the correct values for joint cartilage contact mechanics. So for, for an example, one of the things that we've also looked at is, well, how important it is it for us to have subject-specific geometry in these models? And my former student, Andy Anderson, did a study looking at that. He, we approximated, this is looking in the, in the socket side of the hip. So this is the acetabulum. So if you were to take the femur out and look at the socket that remains, this is the view that you're seeing. And on the left, you see the results for the st contact stress in the subject-specific model in comparison to the approaches that people had used previously in the literature. And one of the things that was always kind of a discrepancy was the measurements that people did in vitro, in cadaveric tissue for contact stress, versus the modeling approaches that people had used previously, which always assumed either spherical or conical geometry. And the discrepancy was that the contact stresses in the experimental studies were always a factor of two higher than what people predicted with their models. And, and they couldn't figure out why that was the case. And, and one of the things that we've been able to demonstrate is that small subtleties and the articular cartilage surface geometry and, and, and the subchondral bone are primarily what drive the contact stress that you predict in the joint. And so the other aspect of cartilage mechanics that we've been looking at in the hip is what sort of constituent models that we need to use for the materials. And it turns out that if you're primarily just interested in the contact stress on the surface, you can pretty much use any constituent model you want and you get a reasonable prediction for the contact stress. And that's illustrated in this picture here where you see the contact stress on the surface in a Neohookian, a fairly simple model, versus a, fiber, a model that has an ellipsoidal fiber distribution. It's an anisotropic model where, the, where it gets more anisotropic as you deform the tissue. But if you look at the maximum shear stress actually through the thickness, you see actually that the maximum shear stress can be quite different, especially at the cartilage bone junction where the articular cartilage tends to delaminate in patients with osteoarthritis. And so we've taken these patient-specific modeling techniques and actually applied them in the clinic now. And we, we've done sets of, of normal volunteers, um, patients with retroverted acetabulae, and dysplastic patients. And we've built patient-specific models of all these different groups. And we've been able to look now at the cartilage mechanics as a function of different activities of daily living, living to understand how alterations in the joint anatomy affect the contact stress predictions. And so we've done that using, as I said, um, um, CT data. So we, we get the patients into the clinic, we inject a small amount of contrast agent into the joint. And that contrast agent allows us to visualize the boundaries between the articular surface layers. And so from, from those image data, we can build up models for each patient showing how their geometry affects their particular mechanics. And using those different populations, we can for instance, predict the stresses and strains in the joint during walking. Uh, we can predict the stresses and strains in the joint during rising from a chair, um, during, during going downstairs. And I'd like to thank my students for putting together this really nice movie showing the cartilage contact stresses, in this case, during walking. And so using this approach, we can we can actually go to our surgeon, Chris, and say, hey, you know, for this patient, here's what we're seeing. Here's what we think's going on in their joint. Here's why we think they're having pain. Here's where we think the problem is with their articular cartilage. And one of, the, one of the major results we found from looking at our normal subjects was that there are small, small changes in the, in small, I would say, irregularities in the, in the geometry of the bones are primarily what control the contact stress patterns that you see on the surface of the joint. And so it it's re becomes actually really important to have that patient-specific geometry in the model in order to be able to accurately predict what the contact stresses are going to be. And so we've applied that to different questions about hip mechanics that have been present in the literature. One of those is regarding the acetabular labrum. If I can show you really quickly, you can see this red stuff around the outside here. This is called the labrum. And this is effectively a fibrocartilaginous thickening of, the, thickening of the articular cartilage itself, the yellow part shown here. And there was always this question as to what the function of the labrum was in both normal subjects and with subjects with dysplasia. And so one of the things that uh, my student Corinne has been working on 
is understanding how much load is transferred to the labrum during different activities of daily living in normal subjects and in subjects with acetabular dysplasia. It turns out that these people that have dysplasia, they oftentimes get uh, lesions of the labrum and, and damage to the labral, labral, labral part of the cartilage. And sure enough, we've been able to demonstrate that the percent load supported by the labrum is, is much higher in these patients. And it's primarily due to the fact that the, the socket, the part that the ball goes into, in a patient with dysplasia, it's shallower. And so as they walk around, the ball tends to load up on the lip of the joint. And so we can tell exactly, using these modeling techniques, how much load is being transferred to the labrum versus loaded onto the femoral cartilage by using these patient-specific modeling techniques. And I just, in summary, we've been able to demonstrate not only differences between dysplastic patients and normal patients, but as Corinne described, we've also looked at patients with acetabular retroversion and how their loading pattern changes as a function of that um, joint irregularity. And these techniques really have a lot of potentially broad applications in the clinic. As, as you can imagine, um, the surgeons are very interested in using this type of technology for surgical planning. So uh, when patients come in with some sort of um, morphological abnormality, the question, as Corinne alluded to, is what type of surgical intervention, if any, is appropriate for that particular patient? And there's a whole spectrum of, of morph morphological abnormalities that these patients present with. And sometimes, you know, they might have, you know, dysplasia, but then they have some other issue as well. And so using these techniques, we can actually help the surgeon decide on a surgical approach or to even rule out potential surgical approaches, which obviously could have a tremendous benefit in terms of the way treatment of hip disorders goes in, in the future. So the final, cat, final topic I'd like to talk about today is something I, I talked to the department about, I think, a couple of years ago, is, is this the software project called FEBio. And this is something that we started about 10 years ago. We, uh, we, as you can tell, we, used to, we do a lot of computational modeling in the lab. And the main technique that we use is, is called the finite element method. And historically, people have used software that's been developed either in the open domain, but primarily commercial software, such as Abacus, Ansys, Adena, et cetera, to do research in biomechanics. And there are a number of problems with this. Primarily, you, know, you don't have the source code. You don't know what it is doing. It's a black box. Further, it's designed for things like you know, primarily structures and airplanes and you know, auto industry. And so if you want to model something like the material behavior of the heart, well, you guess what? You know, there is no heart constitutive model in, in there. Um, you have, it's difficult to verify the codes because, again, you don't know what they're doing. The cost can be as much as $25,000 a year to license the software. And of course, if you're doing research, one of the fundamental things about research is that other people in a lab, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the phrase? You know, a knowledgeable investigator in another lab should be able to reproduce your findings, right? Well, how are they going to do that if they have to pay you know, $25,000 for some software and they have no access to the input files that you use to generate the model and they have no way of viewing your results? So this led us to have interest in developing a software package that would have broad applicability in the field of biomechanics and would be something that was open source and openly available to all the people in our field for free. And so we worked on this ourselves for a number of years. And then in 2008, we were able to get support from NIH to add a number of different features into the software. And since then, it's, it's really taken off and, and, and gained a lot of popularity. And the nice thing about this software is it's tailored to our field. In particular, in, in bioengineering, we deal with tissues that are anisotropic, they undergo large deformations, they grow, they can actively contract. Um, we have movement of charged ions through the tissue as they're deforming. And our software is able to model all of these different types of physical phenomena. And it's relevant in terms of the types of theories that we include. We not only have the continuum theories, but we also support things like multi-scale modeling with homogenization, solute transport, and growth of the tissue as well. And finally, we support the boundary conditions that are kind of unique to bioengineering and biomechanics. Yeah, stretch that battery. Hold on a second there. Uh, sorry. Uh, there. Yes, OK. So how is the software going? Well, it's actually going quite well. Uh, we have about 1,200 registered users now. We, you know, for our most recent grant renewal, we had to keep track of who actually 
wrote something about the software and the literature. So we put together a list of 99 publications that either use FEBio or reference or were about FEBio. And I want to pour out, point out importantly that 64 of those were not from our lab, which I think is something that not, not as always counted, you know. I was like, yeah, we got 50 publications with our software, and we wrote 47 of them. You know? um, and we have, a, we have a forum where we answer questions for people, and there are over 2,000 posts on the forum now. And uh, we've actually fixed most of the bugs that people have reported as well. So I feel pretty good about that. Um, we actually have you know, a software page. You can go there, and you know, we have the domain febio.org. And you know, I don't know if we have any internet access here. Maybe we don't. Uh, but, but you could go there, download the software, try it out for yourself. And it has a really nice um, support mechanism through the forums. Wow, this is, yeah, OK. Let's just see. Let's just see who's on the forums here. So you can go in here and find out what people are complaining to us about mostly, you know. Um, it's, it's, it's mostly, you know. The thing about software development is that uh, you only hear about when there's a problem, you know. People don't log into the forums and be like, oh, your software is great. It works so well. You know, all you hear about is, this doesn't work, this doesn't work. You know. But it's, it's, it's good, though. So you know, people are coming in here, and they tell us about you know, different things that they need help with, and we generally try to help them. You know? so it works out pretty well. And um, oh, I wanted to show the manuals. They're kind of neat. We have all the documentation online. So um, in addition to having. Um, PDFs of all the manuals, we have them all here. So for instance, if you, if you want to look at you know, what's, what's going on in the, user, in the user manual, or you want to look in the theory manual, you can just drill down in here and find all the different sections um, outlined. So if we're interested in viscoelasticity, we actually typeset all the equations. So these aren't graphics. They're all using, they're all using math ML. You know? so, so it's pretty easy to, to find out all the theory behind what you're doing. And we have a full verification suite, too. So if you actually want to see how our software works and whether it gives you the right answer, it's easy to find that out. So last bit of time I have, I just wanted to show you some images of the software and a few examples. And then I'll let you go, get, go eat something. Um, this is the pre, there's three, actually three parts to the software. Preview, FEBio, and PostView. And Preview is the preprocessor, which we use for building models and applying boundary conditions. And this is a screenshot that kind of shows you the different interfaces here. Here's the, here's the model that's being built. We have kind of this, excuse me, we have kind of this hierarchical view of the different pieces of the model, like the geometry, the materials, et cetera. And um, you can obviously you know, change the way things are displayed. You can select nodes, elements, et cetera. Post view is our post processor that we use for visualizing the results from the analysis. And here you can see a mesh of one of our HIP models that's being analyzed here. We're looking at von Mises stress at a particular time. Uh, we can do all sorts. I'll show you some of the other post processing capabilities within the software. And then just recently, uh, Steve Moss, the lead code developer for FEBio, put, um, put, the, put the actual solver FEBio into kind of a GUI. So now you can manage multiple jobs running at the same time as well. So in post view, you can look at different types of shading models for your results. Um, you can create you know, fringe plots with cutaways, isosurfaces, vector plots, et cetera, all the standard ways that we like to look at results. And all sorts of XY plots, including scatter plots, line plots, and bar charts. Um, you can do screen capture, so you can you know, record movies right out, right out of the software and put them into your presentations like I've done here today. And let me just show you a few example problems. This is something from the Cleveland Clinic. They were interested in understanding how friction affected uh, gate across the, across the ground. So we put in a friction model for them so they could look at that in, in, their, in their soft tissue model of the foot. And they're very interested in feet and shoes and things like that. So. Um, this is a model that um, we collaborated with the University of Pittsburgh to develop to understand how the stresses in the shoulder capsule change during a clinical exam. So the clinicians were doing this exam to diagnose injury, but they really had no idea as to which part of the capsule was actually contributing in terms of, although it's not obvious in here, there are kind of discrete thickenings in the capsule that can contribute to the stability of the shoulder. This is a model showing uh, left ventricular um, stresses during both diastole and systole, so you see the passive filling phase, and then you see the contraction. And, and this was all built up using anisotropic constitutive models and active fiber contraction in the model as well. And this was done by uh, 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 Professor Alex Veres. More recently, our collaborator Gerard Atechian has added a lot of really interesting physics to the code. 
Um, one of the things that he's really interested in is, is porous permeable media. So um, poroelasticity, biphasic theory. So, so a lot of soft tissues consist primarily of water. And when that water is able to move relative to the solid phase, then the mechanics of those tissues is, is governed by the initial pressurization of that fluid phase. And then it, as it squeezes out through perme the permeation of the fluid out of the tissue. And one of the things that we've worked on is developing um, contact algorithms that allow, like for instance, if you have two porous permeable materials coming together and they're squeezing together, that fluid can actually flow between the two and you can conserve mass. And so we've we put together some demonstration simulations that kind of show that kind of a problem um, and show that, you know, the pressure is continuous between these two and, and actually allow you to model this type of joint articulation. And this is, a, this is a really common type of model that's used for articular cartilage. The other thing that we've been working on, and I should say, when I say we, I primarily mean him, um, is, is um, mechanochemical simulations. So there are a lot of different applications in biomechanics and bioengineering for being able to um, simulate situations where we have either neutral or charged species that are being, uh, that, are, that coexist within the solid and fluid phases. So you have a solid phase, a fluid phase, and potentially many charged solutes so that as you deform the material, these solutes move in the tissue. And because they may be charged, they set up electrical potentials in the tissue. And there are a lot of potential applications. So for instance, we can look at growth mechanics within this framework, um, binding kinetics, reactive mixtures. Um, we can look at transport of different nutrients within tissues, osmotic, osmotic swelling. It has a lot of application in tissue engineering for understanding, um, for understanding how different reactors, for instance, the geometry will affect the way a tissue could grow. And so um, related to that, we've been working on you know, coupled mechanical and diffusion problems. So this is just an example where we have two contacting layers and we have a difference in concentration initially. And you can actually have the solute flow from one material into the other over time. And so you, it's, you know, basically you have a, you're setting up a concentration gradient. And then that concentration gradient, if, if the materials are charged, will affect, the, again, the mechanics in the tissue. And one of the more recent things that we've been working on is, are, is growth models. And so there are a number of applications for growth models in biomechanics. This is a relatively simple type of growth model called interst interstitial growth. But it can, growth can occur from a number of different mechanisms that change the amount of mass in the material. So this could be, for instance, membrane impermeable solutes that remain soluble form inside the material, solutes that bind to the solid matrix, or water that enters or leaves the material in response to osmotic gradients. And so this is just a simple proof of concept example where we have a beam, it's fixed at both ends, and it undergoes five-fold growth. And we, we apply a small disturbance to nudge it upward. So actually, as it's growing, it kind of buckles down on itself and expands at the same time. And so these are the kinds of simulations that we can now do with this new framework, this multi-material framework that includes um, neutral and charged solutes as well as, as well as growth. And this is just another example of osmotic loading. This is another new feature that we've added into the software as well. And so. Um, What's the plan for the software for the future? We just, we just, we got a two percentile on our first submission of our renewal, so we're funded for another four years. Um, the main things that we're gonna be working on during that time are implementing chemical reactions between the constituents. So now that we can track the, um, the flow and motion of charged solutes within the materials, um, the next thing we wanna be able to do is also allow those solutes to interact with each other and, do, and, and undergo chemical reactions. Um, and in support of modeling cell mechanics, we're working on porous shell elements that allow us to, for instance, simulate um, transport of ions across cell, cell boundaries. And the last, thing that, the last two things that we're working on are kind of more uh, computer science kind of things. So we want to be able to easily extend and apply FE bio to other problems. So actually Lowell's application that he talked about earlier was done with this new plugin framework for the, the version 2.0 of FE bio, where you can take it and actually make use of parts of the code and link into your own software very easily through a, a DLL type framework. And finally, um, we're always looking to make the software a little bit faster and right now we're kind of limited by um, the stiffness and load vector assembly operations. So we're doing some parallelization work during the, the next period of support as well. I think that kind of covers the main things I wanted to speak to you today. I just want to give you an overview of what we do in the lab. These are all the people that, that have contributed to this work. Several of them are here today. I want to thank you all for your help putting together the presentation. 
and to acknowledge the, the, the money that um, the government has kindly given me over the last few years. And uh, also want to mention that we're, I'm hosting this conference here in, in, in April, and there may be some people in this room that are interested in contributing to it. Um, it should be a lot of fun. It's a conference I've, that's been in Europe for actually the last 20 years, and this will be the first time it's been in the United States. And we're hoping that some of the people that haven't maybe gone to the European conference will be more likely you know, to come to the one in the US. And uh, that's, that's pretty much all I have for you to do. Thanks for your attention. I appreciate it.